We are continuing in this series entitled Transformed, and this is going over the basics, but I hesitate to call them the basics because really, although they are the foundation of what we believe, and they, they kind of seem to come back up in all the messages that we preach, these are things that it seems to be most of us kind of get tripped up on. I mean, it almost seems like most of us can't get past one or a few of these basics, but I believe as we go through this series and as we continue to just seek God's word and his heart for what he has for this church and for us as Christians, that we are going to continue to see lives change and we're going to continue to see our hearts grow towards God. In this entire series, we have a book that we're basing it off of entitled 10 Steps Toward Christ by Jimmy Evans. This entire message series is based around 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We with unveiled faces, or in other words, before we were saved, before we were Christ followers, there was this veil that's over our eyes. There was a cloudiness that we couldn't see clearly of. But now that Christ has saved us, he, he set us free, and we place our trust in that. As our hearts begin to be changed and transformed, we're slowly but surely becoming more and more like the people that God has called us to be and to reflect more of his glory and more of his image to the world that is around us. And the message today is focused around having godly fellowship and making sure that the people we have in our lives are those that are intentional and those that we are both helping, but also that are propelling us towards the life, the truth, and the, the holiness that God has called us to live. And do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? God has called us as Christians, he's called us as light bearers. And to be those that shine bright. It's the reason, one of the reasons why we're called Radiant Church is a reminder to shine bright in the midst of darkness. But it says here, what fellowship should we have as light with darkness? What, what kind of fellowship should we have with darkness? And why would we want to associate our light with the darkness that is around us? It says here, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Unequally yoked is an agricultural term where you have two animals, usually oxen, that are, that are placed next to each other, and they have a yoke, which is a, is a fashioned piece of wood that goes between them, and that yoke is attached to whatever cart or whatever they're trying to haul. And the oxen should be lined up so that they actually are the same strength and that they have the same ability and not, you know, not one that is overpowering and one that is weak. And so the yoke attaches them to whatever the job is that they're trying to do, but the problem is if you put a stronger animal with a weak animal, the stronger animal is, well, rather both of them are going to get hurt. One is going to get dragged, one of them is going to get pulled down, and the stronger animal is going to dominate, but eventually the stronger animal is going to get slowed down. And what it says here is don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Now I just want to say this on the front end, I, what I'm not saying is I'm not on an all-out tirade and attack against you having friends that are not saved. In fact, I would say the exact opposite. We need to have people in our lives that we have spent time and we have shown them that we truly care about them. Not just preach at them from a stage, but legitimately that we are being in their life and in their world so that we can draw them to Christ. They see our good works. They see how we live. They hear the good news and they respond to it. So we should surround ourselves and be willing to be in the world around people who aren't saved, but not of the world. In other words, we should, be, we should surround ourselves with those who need Christ because if we just isolate ourselves and create a little bubble so that we're protected, we're not actually fulfilling the Great Commission. 
But in the midst of that, we are not called to fulfill the Great Commission at the cost of our holiness and at the cost of who we are as Christians. We're not called to be changed and all of a sudden give up our values and give up what we have been called to raise high as a standard. We've not been called to lay that down. We need to be able to do both. And that's what I want to focus on today is how do we actually do that? Reading from a portion of Jimmy Evans' book, he says, you must understand that you will always become like the people closest to you. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Notice that he says it is the negative that has greater power than the positive when you are in close relationship or company with them. If you have good habits, bad company will corrupt them. If you don't believe this, you are deceived. So often I minister to people and I talk with them, and they have people in their life, whether it be a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a friend or coworker, or whatever the case may be, where they really like this person. They have a long history with them, and there was, you know, they've always been buddies, or maybe they were with them through a really difficult season in their life, and that's their friend. And, and you talk to them and say, listen, this person is having a negative impact on you. Never, you, know, they, you. You're becoming more like them. You're, instead of shining bright, you're becoming more like the bad habits that they have. And the answer and the response that I hear all the time is, um, but they're a good person. And you don't know what they've done for me. And I love them. And they're, they're important to me. And listen, that's the hard thing about drawing healthy boundaries is recognizing that you can have people in your life that are, are a part of your life, but are you allowing them to have influence and have a voice into your life? I remember growing up, I uh, had some really good friends. They were, they were a blast to hang around with. And they had the same kind of weird, off-the-cuff sense of humor that I have uh, that gets me into trouble way too often. And, uh, but I remember I had this friend, and his name was Elijah, and, and he was just a fun guy to hang around with. And I loved, anytime I got to be around him, I loved being around him. Part of it was because they had like a pool and sea dews and like and snowmobiles, so that, that may have had something to do with it, and, and I didn't have any of that stuff. So, but no, he was just a fun guy to hang around with. And me and my friends, we'd go there, and it was a good thing. But I remember when I started to feel a calling on my life to go into full-time ministry. We're all called to ministry, but I'm talking about vocational ministry, uh, where I felt called to be a pastor. And I remember being faced by not my youth pastor, but it was someone that was on their leadership team and just saying, listen, I know you're really good friends with him, but every time you're around him, you change. And, uh, and not for the good. And my response was like what most of you probably would have, but I care about this person. I'm not just going to shut them out of my life. God hasn't called me to, to avoid people and to isolate myself. No, that's, that's true. But the thing is, there's a big difference between having someone that you're a friend with and having someone that you are close to. Having someone that you truly are doing life with. And the Bible says, like we just read, that you are deceived if you think that you with your good character can stand with someone who does not have good morals and not be affected. You're deceived. So you can fight it. You can justify it. You can have it all worked out in your mind on how you can have it all, you know, make sure that it washes out in the end. But the Bible says that you're deceived. And I think it's because we want so desperately to, to never give up on somebody. We never want to close the door. We never want to say that, hey, you know, I love hanging out with you. We have a great time. But that thing in your life, it's sin, and it's not good, and it's hurting you, but it's also hurting me. We don't want to confront because we don't want to come off as self-righteous, stuck-up Christians, and, you know, and I'm better than you, and, you know, my stuff doesn't stink, but yours does, and we don't want to come off that way. And I, I get that. I've been there many times before. And not even just going to that. I have other situations where I had really good friends, but it wasn't necessarily that they were in sin per se, or that, that, that what it was, but the way that they were living their life was pulling me away from the things that I needed to do as someone that was married, someone that now had kids, and someone that was moving forward and becoming, uh, becoming a pastor. Their, their lifestyle, fine for them, their lifestyle for me and for my wife and for my family just was, was not healthy, not right, and I've had that a variety of times throughout my life. And 
those moments are hard, and I can't say that I've always done it perfectly, because I know I haven't, where I've kind of broken ties and, and walked away from those things. I know that I could, could always do it better, but I, I think if we came right down to it, if we had to identify the one or two or however many people in your life that are maybe negatively affecting you, that would be a hard conversation, especially when the follow-up question is, how much are you giving your life and your time to that person? Now, I'm not saying that they're a bad person. I'm not saying that they haven't helped you and that they haven't poured into your life. But is this person, in fact, maybe this is the better question, is this person encouraging you in the things of Christ or are they like an anchor that's pulling you back? Now, it doesn't mean that you only follow after people that, that are um, you know, are five or six steps ahead of you because I truly believe that we are called not only to be mentored and have somebody pour into our lives, but we also need to have people in our lives that we are pulling up. If we're not, if we're not reproducing ourselves, if we're not going and finding somebody who's maybe weak in an area that we found victory in, if we're not doing that, we're not willing to do that, uh, then, then we're, again, we are allowing ourselves to just be put off in a corner and not allowing our lights to shine for those people who need it. But there's a massive difference between helping somebody and helping somebody while they drag you down. And I, and I will say this, usually you can't tell in the moment. You can't tell, not until it's too late, sometimes it's too late, but you can't tell until all of a sudden there's a moment or an event that happens and your eyes are open and you realize, oh my goodness, things I never would have done, never would have said, never would have thought, why am I here now? You know, that's been said before, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. It's true. It's just a springboard off of what the Word of God says. Bad company corrupts good habits. It corrodes it away. And it doesn't break them. It corrodes it away. It does it slowly. So the hard thing for us to do is to find out where we're really at with people. And, and I, and I kind of look at it this way. It's hard to, you can't ask your friends if them as your friends, if they're good for you or not. Uh, it's like, how do you, hey, are you good for me? Uh, should I be hanging around you? Like, how do you do that? I understand that there's some logistical things involved in here, and we're going to be kind of diving into that as this message goes along. But guys, listen, again, I have been there. I have had to say goodbye to relationships, or I have had to put very clear boundaries in place in order that I can move to the next season of my life. And again, back to being unequally yoked, it's not that Everything has to be lined up perfectly because there's, there's always going to be a little bit of movement. There's always going to be a little bit, you're a little bit stronger for a season. Now they're a little bit stronger. There's going to be some give and some leeway. But by and large, if you are the one that is strong and you are charging forward and you are surrounding yourselves with people that are, that are not passionately on fire for God, they will corrupt your good habits and they will weigh you down and they will eventually veer you and pull you off course. They will. And it doesn't mean that they have evil intent. It doesn't mean that you need to be a jerk to them. It just means we have to respond and view it in a different way. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. And I was looking into that. Iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. As Christians, we are called to not only just live our lives, but we are called to be sharpened by other people and to also sharpen other people. So that's, that's kind of why we do this church thing. That's why we do community groups and, and a variety of other things is so that we can actually grow together. I meet so many people that just want to do their own little home church. That's fine. If you want, I mean, the home churches, I understand there's a lot of churches that start off small and they grow, but they want to have home churches many times just because they don't want to be hurt and they don't want to deal with all the issues that is church. Trust me, on the pastor receiving end of a lot of this stuff, there's a lot of things that come along, good, bad, and indifferent, with being together as a church family. But in the midst of that, we're able to sharpen each other. We're able to make each other more refined for the work that God has called us to do. If you are, if you look at a sword or an axe, if it's dull, it's still going to produce something. I mean, you hit somebody over the head with a dull axe, it's still going to hurt them. Or, you know, if they're, or, or probably that's not a good example. If you try to chop a tree down, <laughs> if you try to chop a tree down with a dull axe, you're going to be out there just getting on that tree for a while and it's not going to come down. You might make a little bit of leeway, but by and large, it's not going to go too far. 
So there's a task at hand. There's something God's called us to do, but we need to be sharp. We need to be refined, and we need to be ready for it. And the Bible says that that's what, that's what we do together. That when we, when we confess our sins one to another, that there is healing in that. I'm not saying that we need to stand up with a microphone and everyone stand on the pew and start sharing what is wrong in their lives and all the things that they've never revealed to anybody else. That's not what that verse means. But it means this, when you have someone that you are close to that is godly, that is on the same path as you, that has the same trajectory, and you begin to share your life, and when you share your life, inevitably that's the good things, but it's also your sins, it's the things that you struggle with. When you share your life, they begin to minister to you and speak life and hopefully speak scripture into your life. Iron sharpens iron. Now, for a long time, I have been afraid of knives. I always have been. Um, I've noticed way too many accidents on myself with them. And I think the very first experience I ever had with a knife was hearing about how my dad with a fish fillet knife just sliced his finger like wide open. And, and so I've always just been real apprehensive around knives. Now, someone just recently told me that if a knife is not sharp, you're more, it's more often that you're going to cut yourself if it's not sharp than if it's sharp. To me, that makes no sense. Well, I mean, it makes sense. I get it. I get that. If it's not sharp, you don't have to push as hard. You don't have to, like, hack away at it. I understand that's probably a little more precise. But still, that idea of, I'm going to sharpen this so that I don't get cut more, uh, just kind of is counterintuitive to the way that I think. But it does seem like every time I use a knife, I nick my hand or something like that happens. And so I'm, I'm always, anytime someone's like, oh, here, I'll just give you my knife. <laughs> they toss it to me to like open a box. I'm just, I can't handle it. It's, even if it's closed up as a little Swiss army knife, emotionally, I just curl up in a ball and cry. Um, <laughs> on the outside, I'm holding it together right now. But on the inside, I am a three-year-old little girl crying. So, <laughs> but they say iron sharpens iron. And I know this isn't iron. I get that. I, I've looked it up. You can't just take another knife and expect a knife. I mean, you can tell I don't know how to do this. You can't take another knife and expect it to sharpen another knife. Reason being is this. They're of the same design. They're of the same material. It doesn't work that way. In order for something to be able to sharpen properly, it has to be of a stronger, more refined material. And it has to be formed in a different way in order to bring about, bring about sharpening a knife. You ever see those like, cooking shows that are all like, hey, 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 hey. Yeah, that, I'm not going to do it because, again, I'm really nervous right now. Even this thing scares me. <laughs> but in order for this knife to be sharpened, in order for that to happen, the sharpening tool has to be stronger. It has to be a better quality. It has to be something that can withstand the, the brushing up against of the knife in order to sharpen that knife down. So back to Proverbs chapter 27, iron sharpens iron. The same thing is true in your life. In order for an area of your life to truly be sharpened by another Christian and to be refined by another Christian, you need to have somebody that has more victory and is stronger and has their head together more than you do in that area. You can't ask, and I say this all the time, you can't ask your broke uncle for financial advice. <laughs> okay, that's like taking a knife and trying to sharpen it on like a brick. It doesn't work. But we need to find people in our lives and surround ourselves with people that are strong in the areas that maybe we're weak in. And it might seem like a little bit flip-flop, like, wait a minute, you're telling me as a Christian I need to be mindful of those I surround myself with and not allow myself to be dragged down by people who are weaker than me. But in the same breath, put that on pause, you're over here saying that I should be, um, that I should be mentoring other people and I should be, because I'm strong in an area, I should be helping them. It kind of seems like you're contradicting yourself. Again, there's a huge difference between allowing yourself to have friends and being around people and being friendly and being kind and showing the love of God and then versus opening your life and your heart up to the influence of those people. Now, for me, I have different people in my life that are all friends, all people that I love, but each one of them, I, I understand rather clearly in my life what they mean to me. I have, I have a pastor friend of mine who he is the definition of a wise person. 
He, he, he's, he's someone I go to and I am just lost and I don't know what to do. I go to this guy and he's just like, well, Proverbs says this or James says it and he just knows it and he's got wisdom upon wisdom upon wisdom. I go to that person. That person is someone that I, I, I'm around. But that person is not someone who does really good with their finances, if I'm just being honest. I'm not, I don't look at their finances and go, that's someone that I want to follow after. So I, I just recognize that. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to listen to what he has to say. I'm not going to cut him off and be rude when it comes to finances. But I'm going to find somebody else in my life that is doing the right thing with finances, that's doing it the God kind of way, and I'm going to surround myself with that kind of person. Too often what happens is this. We surround ourselves with the same kind of knife. We surround ourselves with the same kind of person and then when one person gets offended about something, as a herd, we all kind of move together to the church or to the place or to the, to the message that will appease that area in our life. I see it all the time. People that get offended by the giving of finances, the tithes and offerings that we talk about, and, and they, well, I just don't think that I need to do that. Well, they talk to their friends, and they're all their friends agree. Of course your friends agree. They don't tithe. They're not a part of it. They disagree. They're in disobedience to God. So if you ask your friends, do you really think I should be tithing or do you think that pastor's reaming on and hitting on it too hard? Of course your friends are going to say, oh man, I think the pastor's way out of line. Let's go somewhere else. Of course that's going to happen. Friend, sometimes friends are like sweatpants. <laughs> I'm going to some of this. <laughs> okay? I've been gaining a little bit of weight and uh, a lot. Um, so... <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm at, I'm at work one day. I'm like, man, my pants just feel really comfortable. I'm, I'm digging this. And the whole damn thing, I must be losing weight. I'm doing good. Things are going good for Papa Jer. And that's what I call myself. And, um, and I'm sitting there thinking, this is going good. And then I remember at the end of the day that my wife had bought me one size bigger. Like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. So it wasn't that I was actually losing weight. She just bought me bigger clothes because I was getting bigger. When I say friends are like sweatpants, I mean this. If unintentional about who you surround yourself with, you will only surround yourself with people that are just like you. And so just like sweatpants, they expand with you and they contract with you. So you feel like you have a comfortable pair of pants at all times. Or in other words, do your friends challenge you and push you towards the things of God? Does that waistline push against you and go, hey... You're gaining weight, bro. Back off. You need to throttle it back. The same thing is true with our lives. Are, do you, are your friends just good buddies that you hang around with, or do they actually ask you and push you towards the scripture? Do, when you miss church, are they calling you up and going, where are you at, man? Because we're told in the word of God that we're not supposed to forsake assembling. We're supposed to keep coming together. And I understand you're having a rough time, but it's time to come to church. Sit with me. Are your friends just flexible sweatpants that go wherever you go? Or are they people in your life? And granted, you'll never find someone that fully meets all those requirements. That's why you're surrounded by a multitude of counsel. You should have hopefully more than just one friend. But are they challenging you or are they just going along the flow with you? And too often, I have surrounded myself with wonderful people, but people that just are exactly the same as I am. And that's going to produce the same results that it's always produced. I want to surround myself with people that have gone places I have not gone before and they have a testimony and they have a victory that they can share and they have wisdom that they can impart into my life. Not just because they're fun to hang around with. And I'm not saying you go and call your friends right now and unfriend them on Facebook and just leave me alone and never want to talk to you. But maybe you do start throttling back on how much time you spend with them. Maybe you take an assessment of, is my life looking the way it should look because of my friends or my friends pulling me away from what God has for me. In order for iron to sharpen iron, it has to be of a higher caliber. It has to be of a denser material. There has to be more substance to it. And the same thing is true with us. Here's some way to forge and maintain Christian friendships. Don't look for perfection. You'll never find that one person that's got everything. This is what you look for. You look for someone that is sincere. Someone who sincerely loves God and wants to follow after him. And they adhere to scripture. You got someone that loves God and wants to adhere to scripture, that's a good person to connect to. That's a good person to be yoked up with. Because that person, their heart is tender and right towards God. 
be a part of a big and small church. If you look at the book of Acts chapter 2, it gives a beautiful example of how a church can be growing and numbers can be added to it daily and at the same time it can be small. What I mean by that is this, we have our gathering here on Sunday. And my prayer is that it continues to grow and we continue to add services and and all those kind of things. But you know what? If we just add and add and add and add and never foster real relationships, then this thing is just a facade. At the same time, if all we do is have our one or two friends and we don't have a group of godly Christians that are challenging and encouraging us and we ignore the larger gathering... We're not listening to what God has called us to do, to come together, to enter into his courts with praise and thanksgiving, and to sharpen each other and to strengthen each other. So at this church here, we have our Sunday services, our large gatherings, a big church, but then we also have our community groups. We also have volunteering and serving for different events and different ministries. These are all ways to begin to build friendships. It's not the only way, but if you come here and a year later you're still sitting in these pews and you go, man, no one's been friendly to me, you got to be friendly in order to get some friends. Can I, can I just be honest? And, and I know that's hard for some of you, and I'm not trying to be rude or, in, or uh, uncompassionate about that. But listen, you got to stick your neck out there a little bit and go, okay, I'm willing to allow somebody of higher caliber, I'm willing to allow somebody into my life because I want to be propelled in the direction that God has for me. Don't be hindered by fear or self-consciousness. So many times when we have friendships, we are hindered by that. We're pulled back by, the, by people knowing who we truly are, by us being exposed. If they only knew, if they only had a glimpse into what I've really done and how I thought today and what I really want to say to that person, if they knew, they would never want to be around me. Number one, if you have a tender heart towards God and you want to change and you share that with somebody and they reject you, they're not a, Christian, they're not a good Christian friend. And they're not someone you want to be around anyway. As hard as that rejection would be, they're not someone that exemplifies the love of Christ. Because when someone comes and they say, I'm broken, I'm falling apart as Christians, we need to take a moment and get down in their world and pull them up and not just stand on our world and point at them and tell them how wrong they are. And that's what I mean. I'm not saying go and throw away all your friends, but I am saying this. Some of your friends you need to re-put into a different category as just some good friends that you talk and hang out with every once in a while. And there's some people that you've been putting on the outskirts of your life or maybe altogether you've not been pursuing those kind of relationships, whether at church or otherwise, and you need to because those people will, will bring you to a new level of relationship with God. So don't be hindered by fear or self-consciousness. If, if you bring things up and again you're rejected, those are people that you don't want speaking into your life anyway because they don't care about you and they're not exemplifying Christ. Don't let those people mark what it looks like to be a Christian. Christians get down in the muck and the mire and they clean somebody off and they feed them and they clothe them spiritually and naturally and they walk with them. But again, we walk with people to the measure in which we are not affected. If we begin, like if I'm struggling with, you know, being an alcoholic and I've gotten free from that, I don't go into a bar and start ministering to people because at that point, that is a place of weakness for me. Now, maybe 40 years down the road, you've got it, you, you're strong enough, but if you walk in there and you try to minister to people because you have some victory, if you're in there long enough, temptation is going to hit you hard, wave after wave and you have the high potential of falling apart again. So yeah, there are some things you need to avoid, and that also means there's some people you need to avoid as well. Bad company corrupts good habits. I know this is an offensive message. I get it. I get it. But are those people, just because of your good experiences with them, are those people worth you being derailed on the mission and the calling that God has placed on your life? Is it worth it? At the end of the day, you getting pulled off and never fulfilling what God has truly called you to do, is it worth just having a few more laughs, a few more drinks, a few more good times to post on Facebook? Is it? Or do you want to surround yourself with people that are charged up and on fire? Avoid separation due to offense or disappointment. You cannot be in a church a community group, a ministry environment. You cannot be around people without being offended. 
Guys, listen, I would love to stand up here and say that I've never been offended by this church and never been hurt by this church. It, it wouldn't be the truth. The amount of times that I've walked away from here hurt, frustrated, angry. But you know what? I get back up and I come back to church, not because it's my job, but because I understand that there's something more important that I have to do and that all of us have to do. You have to just get, you got to get a little bit tough skin and realize you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be hurt by your pastor, disappointed by a community group leader. You're going to be, you're going to be, feel like you've been slighted by someone at church because that, you know what? Here's the thing. We all have bad days. All of us do. That's why we need to have compassion. There's days that I'm strong and I'm the guy that's, you know, running and charging with the flag. And there's days that I'm weak and I need people to pick me up and help me. That's why we need to have compassion. So don't allow yourself to be isolated because of offense or disappointment. And last one is don't let busyness keep you from church. Church being this, being groups, different ways that we meet. Don't allow busyness to do that. I know a lot of you would instantly say, yeah, but my job. I'm going to say something. You're not going to like me, and I don't care. <laughs> Find a different job. It's not worth it. At the end of the day, you not being able to worship with your family, you not coming to church, not having a church family, it's not worth it. Whatever the amount that they're paying you, it's not worth it. Get a different job. Thank you, one person. <laughs> and this is why. I've heard this saying before. If the devil can't get in front of you and stop you, he will get behind you and push you too fast. So if he can't get, you know, you're just like, I'm a mega Christian, I can do this. And, he, and you're just walking the walk and doing your thing. And he can't stop you and he comes against you like, uh-uh. And you just start kicking the word out to him. And that's what you do. And you, he's not going to stop you in front of you. Fine, I'll get behind you and I'll make you incredibly busy. I'll make you so busy that you miss once a month and now twice a month and now three times a month community group and now I just don't go to community group and now I don't go I go to church like once maybe twice a month no if he can't stop you from in front he's going to push you so fast that you can't that you're, you become too busy and you can't do what you've been called to do do not get sucked into being busy as you stand to your feet Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 through 25 says this and let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us consider how to stir up each other, how to bring good works to each other, how to encourage. Listen, being God, having godly friends is not just about training and educating people and building walls and boundaries and all these different things that we put in place, there has to be a real relational love component to it. It has to be the foundation where you look somebody in the eyes and you mean it that you love them and that you're there for them and you're going to walk through the good times and the bad times with them. Let us look for ways to stir things up in each other's hearts, to encourage and to strengthen each other. If all this falls away and you still have more questions, well, what about this particular situation? What about this guy that's in my life or this friend? Listen, I can't answer all those questions in a message, but I can say this. Begin to ask God and pray and seek his face and say, God, is this person who for this season do you want in my life? Or is this someone that I need to, I need to kindly and with a gentle heart begin to put some different boundaries up, and, and to, to redefine that relationship. I tell you what, it's one of the hardest things you'll ever do is redefine a relationship, redefine a friendship. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. But some of you, you cannot get through to the next level that God has for you. You can't break through that glass ceiling until you change who you associate with. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. It does. So in the midst of that, guys, let's keep meeting. Let's keep growing together. Let's keep being iron that sharpens each other. One day you'll be the strong iron that can sharpen somebody else. One day you'll be the one getting sharpened. Either way, it only happens when metal hits metal. You can't just have a strong metal and a weak metal and expect them to sharpen each other. There has to be metal to metal contact. Or in other words, get used to people being around you get used to people being in your life and pursue that because in those environments that's where change and growth takes place let's pray lord we thank you god that you have called us to a place of christian fellowship 
growing in our understanding, growing in our grace, growing in our relationships with those that are around us. Lord, I ask that you help every person here to be able to identify who is in their life and how much time and energy and and openness they should give to those individuals. And Lord, I pray that there's not a single person that walks away from here today uh, going out of here just to be mean to other people and kick them out of their lives, Lord, but I pray that you give them grace, you give them the words, you give wisdom, and Lord, I thank you that in the midst of that, Lord, you will begin to show yourself faithful in those areas of of our lives, God, that we have not seen growth in, that we've not seen progress in. God, I thank you, Lord, that on the other side, of this obedience, although difficult, on the other side of it, God, there is always a commanded blessing. So, Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, help us to not be deceived. Help us to have our eyes wide open and be growing in you along with other people. God, I love you and thank you for that.